This is Lisa from Mobile Tech Review, and now for something truly different. This is the Microsoft Surface Duo. So this is their two screen connected by a hinge phone, sort of like if you could Lenovo yogurt your way into a phone. So, you know, I had preconceptions about this, much as I'm the unbiased person who always tries to just to find the tech that works best for me. But I thought, you know, two screen phones, they're a stopgap measure because you can't make a folding phone yet or one that's durable enough or cheap enough, that sort of thing. And, you know, I watched Microsoft's presentation and Panos Panay, who's the head of all service products, and you know, he could sell underpants to an elephant. He gets so excited. And I got a little jazz, but I still thought, I don't know. And then I got it in my hands, and wow, this is pretty neat. We're going to look at it now. So obviously, instead of going the folding screen route, Microsoft has something completely new here with two 5.6 inch OLED displays connected by a very thin gap and two hinges that hold in any position. So again, it's just like a yoga -ing laptop. You can put it in tent mode, presentation mode, laptop mode. Of course, Microsoft has these funny names that have come up with like compose mode for laptop mode, but you know, whatever. So that solves a whole lot of problems in terms of, you know, you're always trying to prop up your phone and then you drop it or you're buying little stands for your phone. Uh, pretty much you can always find a position for it. 5.6 inches to me sounded pretty small. I don't like small screen phones. I have a Pixel 4a, I admit. I would use it, but that 5.8 inch screen is too small. But aha, uh -huh, the aspect ratio of these displays is four by three, like an iPad mini. So you remember the days when we had 16 by nine aspect ratio phones, 1920 by 1080, for example, and that was great for watching video and it wasn't so super narrow as today's phones get more and more narrow. And at first when manufacturers switched to those, we all complained about how narrow but tall they were. Well, you have less usable space for things like taking notes, for reading any kind of content because it's constantly line wrap, line wrap, and mobile apps has to be designed like a column. With this, you got the room to spread out. Take a look at what it looks like next to that Pixel 4a. It looks huge, right? And that's just one of the screens. So if you open it up, you get nominally an 8.1 inch display, but obviously there is a seam. It might be a lot narrower than something you'd see like on the LG phones that have the optional display cases on them, like the LG Velvet that we have that you can see here, which has a humongous gap and is much thicker and more awkward and all that sort of thing, but there's still a line there. So this product is not perfection. And this gets down to what it is you want to do with your phone, right? If you're primarily buying your phone for consuming content, like say just videos, you're happy to do one thing at a time, which we all think we are, because that's been the only choice that we've had. I'm going to talk about that. Anyway, obviously something like the Galaxy Z Fold, if you can afford that, it's even $600 more, is much more enjoyable for tablet use without a line down the middle. So when I said we're going to talk about that a whole, you didn't know you wanted to do it. And, you know, I was talking with my crew here and we were saying that, you know, the, a good device solves a problem you knew you already had. Say like the Galaxy Fold products and Galaxy Z Flip, you want a bigger single screen, but you don't want to carry around a bigger device, hence folding screens. Well, just like when the iPhone came out, you, there, that solved a whole lot of problems you didn't know you had until you had an iPhone and the world changed. This one solves the problem of, you can only do one thing on your phone at a time easily, right? You're swapping in and out of screens, it becomes really painful, and you think, well, I'm okay with that. But that's because you've been used to that for more than 10 years. And once you actually get this in your hands and you use it and you go, aha, uh -huh. for example, I was running a speed test because this has very fast cat 18, 4x4 MIMO antenna LTE. Yes, it's not 5G, but this is the fastest 4G I've ever seen. So I had speed tests running on the screen, and that's not the most exciting thing to watch, folks. So and I pulled up something else I wanted to do on the other screen, and I was like, huh, you know, you wouldn't think you needed that or you wanted that until you had it. And then you, you just a light bulb goes off in your head. And then there's more obvious things because you can have Microsoft Edge, the web browser. You can use Chrome too, but, uh, and one of the Microsoft apps says install, say OneNote or Word, and you want to drag some text from a web page or an image and throw it right into your document. That's obviously very easy. If you have kids, you have a baby monitor running. Well, that's taking up your full screen on your phone and there goes your phone being a useful thing, right? Now you've got your baby monitor running in one screen and whatever else it is you want to do. Or you're watching a game walk through video on YouTube on one screen and you're scrolling through Reddit or Discord on the other to see what people are saying about getting through that game. You know, there's just a lot of different things that you can use this for and you wouldn't have thought of it. And that's still using it as two separate screens. 
which is kind of the beauty of doing this, much as it might seem awkward compared to a Galaxy Z Fold, because any app runs just normally and fine. It's just two separate screens on here. So no resizing, no weird behavior and bugs other than sometimes rotating in landscape. Some apps will stay in narrow mode on a single screen mode. But other than that, it's just business as usual. You don't need developers to support this, which often, you know, with corner case phones or ones that don't sell 40 million, they never do support it. It's just all going to work pretty nicely. And when I multitask, I love my Galaxy Note phone, for example, but still, you know, Samsung has had multi-window multitasking forever. Or even on the Z Fold, it's still a fidgety, more painful experience, and not all apps work very well. And then you get into that aspect ratio problem where you've got two very narrow columns. It's pretty hard to be productive. You might turn it in landscape, and then you've got two little small squares here. It's just never been inviting enough. In fact, even on the iPad Pro, I love the iPad Pro, but the multitasking is so fidgety on that that I find I almost never use split screen mode. On this, it's like a no-brainer. And the gestures, I was really surprised. Yes, I know the there was a limited number of very early reviewers who got this many weeks ago, and they got really buggy software. And I think Microsoft screwed up, and they shouldn't have sent them, sent them out as soon as they should have, right? So we have the software that came out in the very last few days that reviewers had it, and all of you will get when you unbox it. There's another update coming, I hear, that Microsoft's working on pretty soon. But anyway, now that the software is pretty solid, I won't say it's bug-free, I won't say you don't want to reboot this phone every couple of days, but the gestures that Microsoft built in here are just so brilliant. You just flick an app from one screen to the other. It's just as easy as you wish it would be. If you remember the courier concept that Microsoft showed, I don't know how long ago, and it looks so easy-peasy, well, that's the way it is here. You flick, you flick, it's great. You want to get rid of it, you just swipe it back down again. If you want to go full screen, it's a little more effort. You've got to drag it and hold it over the center area until it shows that it's widening to take up the full screen. So that's really nice. One thing that can get a little complicated though, you can either use the traditional Android navigation with the little button bar on the bottom, or you can use Android gestures. Then you've got a lot of gestures to keep track of. I mean, I have no problem doing swiping sideways to go back and all that sort of thing that way to go forward. But I find that bringing up the multitasking interface is a little bit hard when you have Android gestures enabled too. So you might want to turn that off. So the software, no, it isn't perfect on this. Uh, no, I haven't seen any graphical glitches or anything really horrible happening. I have seen it get stuttery every once in a while. I haven't had any problem with Microsoft Swift Key Keyboard, which, by the way, you can have it go full screen normal if you want across the bottom. You can do it in split key. You can have a floating keyboard. And so far, it's worked for me. I have no problem with the space bar or anything. But it's kind of normal sometimes seeing an app crashes or Microsoft Launcher crashes, which this is what this is running, but mostly it's been pretty good, and if they have an update again real soon, hopefully it gets even better. So that's all real nice, isn't it? And tablet mode, I won't say it sucks, but it, you have a bar. So for programs that are designed to handle that bar, like Amazon's Kindle, you've probably seen the demos. You've got two, two pages. It's just like the most expensive you know, e-reader. And also Google Play Books supports that too. So that's the sweetest thing in the world. Comixology, though, does not yet. So you're left with a tablet -y interface. So pretty much you want to turn that and use it in the kind of upright full screen mode so that the line between the two displays lines up. But you get the idea. If you're looking to watch full screen YouTube on this 8.1 inch style, that's a total fail because you're always going to have the seam between the two screens there. If you're happy propping on your desk in tent mode or presentation mode just to watch it playing on your desk in one screen, then it works out really good. So it's puppy dogs, it's roses, right? So what is it? Well, you know, the phone mode isn't as bad as I thought it would be. I mean, people were having such a hard time trying to figure out how this would be a phone that they're saying, oh, no, it must not really be a phone. Yes, it's a phone, folks. What I do is because it's 360-degree hinges and we have glass on the back, Gorilla Glass 5, and on the front is I just swap it out so the displays are on the outside always. So then it's easy to use as a phone. I mean, both sides are glass. They're just as breakable, so whatever. That's one way of dealing with it. The fact they didn't put any kind of outer display on the back side, which is a pretty light gray glass, is mystifying, but I guess it's one of the many, many, many concessions this phone makes for being so thin. No manufacturer has been able to make a phone as thin as this is, 4.8 millimeters, closed 9.9. .9. That means that closed, this thing isn't much thicker than most other phones are open, even skinny phones like the Galaxy Z Flip. 
Wow. So to make it that thin so it doesn't feel like a mini laptop or a burden or something like that, and to make it balanced, I suppose, too, well, there are concessions here. So no room probably for outer display, no room for an outer camera. So the way the camera works is there's one in display camera and that's an 11 megapixel camera with an f2.0 lens that is verging on potato camera level. Let's put it that way. So you're using it and it's geared obviously towards Zoom or Skype video conferencing and doing selfies. So, but what you do is you just turn the phone around and it has this brilliant thing where it says tap on the other screen to make the screen active and then the camera swaps to being a rear camera mode. Still, this is not a fast and great experience if you're in a hurry to catch your kid taking his or her first steps. So you don't have the time for that. So not brilliant. No room for a second camera. And it's not a great camera. Uh, you know, in Outdoors in daylight or in a very well lit interior space, I'm talking like inside of a Best Buy, not inside of your living room at night. It takes fine photos and they're undersaturated a little bit and they can use a little more contrast, but that's such a simple thing to fix with a photo editor. It's probably not the end of the world if you want to amp the colors up a little bit. It's okay. The 4K video is okay, but when you move indoors, forget it. Anything approaching sort of like low light, I don't mean night shots, is pretty much garbage. It's a slow lens. It's a skinny phone. I guess they couldn't do better, but I keep thinking if they had some of Google's Pixel software engineers have at it, they could probably do something with this. And Microsoft has really good Surface cameras on their Surface tablets and laptops, so I'm hoping somebody there knows how to fix this problem, because if this is going to be your primary camera, you're going to be bummed, unless you don't really much care about the camera in your phone. Next up, no 5G. This is 4G LTE. It may be the fastest darn 4G LTE I've seen on a phone yet, but no 5G. So for something as pricey as this, well, if you want to be forward looking, but I know a lot of you don't care about 5G now, it's, it's, it's a hurt that it doesn't have it. We have the Snapdragon 855 chipset, probably because it uses less battery power and it requires less cooling space too. So that's last year's processor in a phone that is $1399 to $1499, depending on whether you want 128 or 256 gigs of storage. So, you know, I'm using last year's Galaxy Z Flip and Galaxy Fold, and honestly, performance-wise, I have no issues with that. I don't think any of you, probably in normal use, even with the heavy multitasking, would. But the six gigs of RAM, let's have a moment of silence. I can't figure that out. Because, yeah, sure, you know, a Pixel might have six gigs of RAM, be fine. That's a single screen doing one thing at a time. This is a phone that just says, go ahead, run 10 apps and keep switching between them and all that. And it would be better to have more RAM. And I think that's why we see those occasional stutters and slowdowns and a reboot really helps with that every couple of days. Because I guess they couldn't fit more RAM in there. I mean, that's the only reason I could think of. There's no expandable storage, but so many phones don't have that, and so much stuff is on the cloud. I'm not going to complain so much about that. There is no wireless charging because there is no room for a wireless charging coil, so there's that. Um, I wish there was, but it doesn't hurt. It's not IP68 water resistant, something I thought maybe it would be because these are two separate displays, not a folding flexible has an open area kind of thing. I guess they couldn't seal the hinges enough. Still, it's a, your typical glass phone. I take a very damp rag and I clean it off. You know, you don't immerse this in water, folks, but, and that sort of thing is fine, especially in these days of COVID where you're worrying about keeping germs off of your phones, but concessions to make it this thin. To make it this thin, so you say, hey, this isn't any thicker folded than my old phone was open and I can maybe live with this. But it's also a wide phone. The great thing about the four by three aspect ratio is your screen feels so big, right? I mean, yeah, nice. But then it's a wide phone to hold in your hand too. So ergonomically, how comfortable is that? I leave that up to you. But I'll tell you this, this is what I do. I don't carry it, you know, even if both displays are up, I don't try to do this all the time, although I have really big hands, I can. I carry it like a book, like a moleskin, like this, and then it becomes a lot easier. And there are already dbrand and other companies are going to have skins for this, and like the leather one is going to be really cool, like, you know. So it'll make it even more grippy because glass is always a little slippery. It's not slippery. Another thing you don't get, you might think you do because you see this other thing next to the camera, and that's a flash. Who uses the flash on their phone? But anyway, it's not a facial recognition camera. 
I think also in part because Microsoft's into like secure 3D facial recognition, all this stuff for enterprise users, and 2D facial recognition is not so secure and gets fooled by a picture of you. Whatever it is. Obviously, there's probably no room for that either, but it has a fingerprint scanner on the side, and it works so well. Fingerprint scanners and me, we don't get along. And I'm left-handed, so I tend to hold it and use it with my thumb, which is like the worst digit to use, apparently. It works really well. It's Android. It has location unlock. It works better than most phones. Most phones, I always have location unlock on, so when I'm at home, it should stay unlocked. That works maybe 60% of the time. On this, it works 100% of the time. The build quality, you've seen other videos on this, you know, it's, it's superb. It's a gorgeous looking piece of hardware that hinge is just firm and perfect and all that sort of thing. So I don't have to talk to you about that. I, I know a few people on forums have said they got one where the glass wasn't glued on straight or anything like that. Uh, this one's absolutely fine. The fingerprint scanner to my eye doesn't look crooked. You have a USB-C port, you have no headphone jack. It's a good USB-C port because yes, I tested it. It works with keyboards, it works with mice, it works with monitors. So for you serious business surface kind of people. Yeah. So given the fact there is no outer display, for those of you who do decide to carry it this way instead of, well, I do out mode, like I said, like so. Uh, yes, you can use a smartwatch. So gee, you gotta buy one more thing, but probably a bunch of you have maybe one of some kind of smartwatch. I, I'm using the Galaxy, Galaxy Watch Active 2 with this because Android Wear watches still aren't all that. Yes, it works just fine. You install it on the Galaxy Wear app and then you make sure it installs the watch plug-in and everything's gonna work. Also, I'm using Galaxy Buds Plus earbuds, same thing, using the Galaxy Wear app, so you can use any Bluetooth that you want. Uh, the only thing is, I can tell you, well, this might have great 4G reception. The Bluetooth radio on this doesn't have great range. It's only about 20 feet, and normally with a set of earbuds, I can go 30 feet or so. So that that's a little bit of a gotcha, but it does get you around the whole problem. No headphone jack and, well, no external screen for notifications. Another problem that a watch would solve is the fact that there's also no NFC on this phone. So if you've got a watch with NFC, you can, for example, I use Samsung Pay on my Galaxy Watch Active 2. But you were waiting for the pen, weren't you? Hi, tablet PC review folks. The, you've got a Surface Pen that you can use with this. It does not fit in a silo. It does not because reasons. It does not come in the box because Microsoft, when you buy any Surface product, you have to buy the pen. So I, it works with the Surface Slim Pen and it works also with the regular Surface Pro Pen, which is the one that I'm going to demo using. You get a little bit better line quality with the Surface Slim Pen. It's the newest and most expensive of the pens, no surprise. You know. So they're between $59 and $120 for those. There are third-party pens. The Wacom Bamboo Ink Plus was acting weird though, so I don't think that one's going to be a go. Anyway, yes, magnets, of course, is a Surface product. So there are magnets on this device to help keep it closed, and the magnet also holds the pen in place. A little help with the fact that there's no silo and one you can stick in there. The pen works just like it does on Surface Pro devices or Surface laptop, you know, that sort of thing. Which is to say, if you're an artist, Wacom EMR, which is what the Galaxy Note series uses, is still the best in terms of smooth line fluidity if you're an artist. If you're just a note taker, you won't care. This is really fun with OneNote. And this is also, speaking of the Galaxy Note series, one of the upsides of this. Say you're holding it in book or moleskin mode, I'll call it, and you're just taking some notes. It's wide enough, it's like a moleskin or a notepad, that you have enough room to write several words on each line. Whereas with the Galaxy Note series, because they become so tall and wide, it's like I write two words on a line. It doesn't really feel as natural. This doesn't have any nifty feature like the Galaxy Note has and Samsung's way more evolved in the software. They've been doing this for a long time. So there's no screen off, take a note kind of feature, which would be so cool to have. So this is still a 1.0 product, but it has a lot of promise. It's pretty exciting. And it was something I thought was virtually pointless and now I think is really useful. The phone has a 3577 milliamp hour battery and battery life on this is a bit better than I expected given that it has two screens. It does help that it's 4G and not 5G and OLED's fairly power efficient as long as you're not displaying a lot of white. But anyway, I've been averaging five and a half to six hours of screen on time and I've been using dual screen mode quite a bit which would obviously use a lot more power than using just one of the screens at a time comes with an 18 watt, the so-called fast charger, but considering 15 watts kind of average, 18 watt isn't that much faster, so yeah, it's not a very fast charger. 
So if you're thinking about this and the price of this, this is about the same price as a Galaxy S20 Ultra, or $100 more than a Galaxy Note 20 Ultra, right? They're doing the same trading program that Samsung does and other companies do. So you can get, if you say you had a Note 10 and you're upgrading, you can get $650. That's almost half off the product. It gets a little less painful. If you're on the fence about this and you think you want to try it, by the way, Microsoft sells it direct on their websites, unlocked, Best Buy carries it, AT&T is the only official carrier offering this. If you buy it from Microsoft's website, you get 60 days to try it out. So that's nice. It's not one of those usual like 15 days and you got to figure it all out. So you got time to live with this if you want to take a bet on it. But still, it's a 1.0 product. I'm not saying all of you should go out and buy one, even though I'm obviously pretty excited about it. There's the things you're giving up. We have nearly a potato camera on here. There's no 5G, stuff like that. There's no facial recognition for those of you who prefer that kind of experience. But there's so much going on here that just changes the way you use a phone in a way I didn't think was possible. And I didn't know I needed it. And now I feel like I do. But it sure is worth watching this space. I'm Lisa from Mobile Tech Review. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more cool tech videos and hit the notification bell so you know about them. Oh, and by the way, we're going to smack this down with the Samsung Galaxy Z Fold 2.